Welcome to The Real News Network. I'm Paul Jay. Donald Trump's choices so far for his cabinet tell us something about the direction his administration will be going. Flynn at National Security Advisor, Pompeo at the CIA, Sessions for Attorney General. All of these, and of course I should back up, maybe most importantly, Pence at Vice President, who says he will model his vice presidency after Dick Cheney, and many think he will have power similar to Dick Cheney's. All of this tells us that this could be an administration which is Act Two of the Cheney-Bush administration. And how does that affect the intelligence community? How might people react to that, especially people that might consider themselves to be whistleblowers? And now joining us is a whistleblower, Thomas Drake. Thomas is a former senior official of the U.S. National Security Agency, the NSA, a decorated United States Air Force and United States Navy veteran, computer software expert, linguist, management, and leadership specialist, and as I said, a whistleblower. Thanks for joining us, Thomas. Uh, thanks for having me again. So wh wh how, how do you think or what do you hear uh, the intelligence community will respond to all of this? We're told it may be that there will be a freer hand on various things that have been described as torture. Uh, Pompeo and others, uh, Flynn, seem to be very pro-mass surveillance. Uh, how, what's the intelligence community? Are they happy about all this? It probably depends on how you want to look at it. I mean, there's a lot of jockeying going on, a lot of uh, sort of information that's being anonymously released uh, to certain outlets. Uh, what I call sort of the shaping and forming of opinion. Um, I did, I, I can remind all of your listeners that at NSA there was the old joke that, you know, directors come and go, we're still here. And this is with respect to sort of the intelligence community establishment. Presidents come and go, we're still here. Uh, so it's important to note that despite elections and despite agency heads coming in and out, you know, and they're given terms, you know, of two, three, four, five, sometimes longer. Um, there is an establishment, and it largely uh, it sits um, deep, deep as a deep state, the, you know, the double government, the shadow government. But they're not, uh, obviously, they're not unaffected by an election, particularly an election um, that, we just, that we just had. And we're in this rather special period in terms of the U.S. Constitution, uh, we have a president-elect, but you still have the sitting president who has all the power of the presidency and that the full power of the new president uh, doesn't happen until inauguration. Um, so we're in you know, the beginning stages of transition. You mentioned a few names. But how would you tell it to you? I think, personally, uh, just as a broad stroke uh, answer to you, is that they actually were expecting or anticipating and had even a preference for a Hillary Clinton administration. Uh, Hillary and why is because she was really status quo. Um, she's more Republican in that respect uh, than than Trump, and I think it would have it would have been easier uh, for the intelligence community to adjust. Having said that, uh, based on the choices that Trump is evidencing so far, and remember this is early on. I think you could easily argue that it's a return to more secrecy. It's a return to a Bush-Cheney II. Uh, it's law and order. Um, it's back to uh, certain types of executive actions that have been sort of finessed by Obama, um, but also put on the special presidential uh, secrecy plate, that platter that he is handing off those special presidential powers he's handing off uh, to uh, Trump. And I have to say, uh, you know, I look back on these past eight years, and if anything, Obama, uh, with a couple of minor exceptions, uh, has institutionalized what many people thought was an eight years worth of anomalies uh, after sort of the overreach and the overreaction post 9-11 and has essentially provided uh, the country, and most of it is still secret, interestingly enough, even though a lot's come out, what he has referred to as the legal framework, and I believe that's his legacy. He would have preferred Hillary himself. He made that crystal clear. The legal clear. framework for what? The legal framework for all the expansion of powers, 
um, the full legalization of much of those things that were actually patently illegal and unlawful and unconstitutional under Bush and Cheney all accelerated the very end of the Bush administration with certain legislative acts that were signed into law and further expanded, uh, further expanded by, uh, by Obama. For example, the NDAA amendment that allowed the armed forces to arrest people. Well, the 1021, 1022, the 1021 in particular, extremely concerning. Um, the National Defense Authorization Act is, is a largely um, an executive-driven uh, act. Um, they have a tremendous influence over it. Yes, that's one example. Um, and that's, that's a particularly important example because now that power, uh, essentially, if I understand that amendment correctly, it allows the armed forces to arrest anyone who they can accuse of being connected with the Taliban, al-Qaeda, or terrorist activity. And that is a pretty broad stroke. And that power is now in the hands of what will be the new commander-in-chief. Right. And see, this is part of what I have considered the dystopian reality post 9-11 that so much of this space has become increasingly militarized. And that means it's more beholden to Article II powers under the commander in chief than not. And the more the executive has in terms of that, that kind of running room in terms of its ability to execute, the harder it is for Congress and others to rein it in. Now, that's not to say, sort of the irony here, is if Trump decides to push those boundaries in a more uh, pro-Bush, pro-Cheney mode, um, you might find certain parts of uh, the political establishment, particularly independents and Democrats, and even uh, independent Republicans, waking up. This was always the great fear. I mean, this is something that I have said for many, many years. You might accept that Obama was more, and I will actually argue against it, but more restrained in the use of executive power. The real concern, this was voiced early on, is it became evident that he was not going to uh, roll back the Bush-Cheney era. What would happen if someone like a Bush-Cheney became president? And people were thinking, oh, that's off in the future. Well, it's very possible that it's, it's now arrived. Yeah, I, I always thought the distinction between Clinton and Trump and, and the teams that, that are around them is that Obama, I think Clinton, on the whole, uh, while they agree with the, the neocons and, and the Trump types and, and the people around him, they all agree on the importance of make America great again, which means defend the empire and, and make sure it's as strong as possible. But, but I always thought Obama and Clinton listened to the professionals on how to do it more. Uh, whereas uh, Cheney had, and Bush had, and, and his gang of Rumsfeld and Wolfowitz and those guys, the Project for New American Century people, and for anyone that doesn't know that document, look it up and, and the whole game plan is in that document. Um, they weren't all that interested in what the professionals had to say. They, they thought, uh, quoting a Bush official, they make their own reality, which starts with a regime change in Iraq and then goes to Syria and then goes to Iran, and I'm not sure wh which one comes next. Um, but, but Trump and, and the people around Trump look Cheney-esque. They, they don't look like they will listen to the professionals, and I, that's why I wonder how the professionals might think about that. Well, <laughs> Think about some of the selections, choices that have been made already. Uh, there's even there's even now some of the latest latest news over the last day or so about um, the Marine General Mattis uh, as possibly becoming the Secretary of Defense. Um, that means, and that tells me something because if you look at Mattis, you look at Flynn, uh, you look at this this dynamic going on uh, with. Uh, Clapper resigning, but also uh, apparently this the separation of Rogers uh, from from enjoying enjoying uh, the support of of the uh, the last vestiges of the Obama administration as they're exiting. Uh, that tells me, and then you, that Trump is actually more interested in those who might have found themselves on the wrong side of the Obama administration. I mean, Obama has made no qualms about. Uh, putting putting his foot down when he thought that you know there were generals or those in the direct chain of command, especially under Article Two, 
uh, were, were taking issue with him or contending with him. Uh, it's clear that he took great umbrage, uh, umbrage at that um, and made sure that they were punished. That tells me something. That tells me that there's another level of loyalty, which is more like Bush Cheney in that regard, uh, that when asked to do sort of the dirty work of the empire, there's going to be a greater willingness uh, to do that, greater willingness in terms of just sort of doing it without t attempting to nuance it. And, and that's, I think that's a concern in terms of, of sort of the empire. But I don't want to discount, right, you know, this sort of the friendly face of the empire versus uh, a much sterner face. Um, I'm not going to let uh, the Obama administration uh, off the hook that easily, believe me. Now, now uh, from what I understand from various sources, including John Kiriak, who another whistleblower was at the CIA, who said there were these morning meetings of, uh, I guess it's the undersecretaries and, and number twos in all the agencies, uh, would have a, a morning phone call, and Cheney would, would chair this phone call in the lead up to the war in Iraq. And if you didn't want to go to war in Iraq, you could quit or resign. And Cheney was very clear that, about that. And Kiriakou said almost, if not all, the agencies represented in those phone calls were against the war in Iraq, saying that it was t going to turn into a disaster. You couldn't control the outcome. You would probably strengthen Iran. And Cheney overrode that. Um, and, and when you talk about the deep state, does it have a, 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 any agenda that's different than the agenda that's more apparent from the heads of these agencies and such? And, for example, on Iraq, and would the deep state have any different agenda on Iran than, than perhaps the people that are more professionally known as the administrators and people running these organizations? Well, to me, they, they're sort of overarching. They're sort of the, the supra uh, supra in terms of the deep side uh, of, of the state because they're in place. I mean, <laughs> you, you have a paradox here of power, and information is power. And those uh, people want access to it. They don't want to lose it. If they, if they lose it temporarily, they want back in. It's, it's incredibly seductive. And there, the establishment, you want to call it the deep state establishment, is well positioned to influence uh, and shape those who are in, in those political positions, uh, pointy positions or equivalent, uh, the heads of agencies. And they prefer that they have the protection and kind of leave us alone. Now, you just mentioned it situation in which Cheney overrode them, but how many people resigned their office? How many people actually went public? How many people decided to contend with that? No, they, quote unquote, as I found out myself, more, far more willing to just look the other way because someone else made the decision and, you know, I'll follow orders. Yeah, there, there were but a I, handful of people that quit, but it was literally a handful. Well, a handful, I'm not, but not enough to actually affect anything significant. You don't, there was no, and that's part of the risk here, right? There really is, that's part of the risk. But I'm saying under Obama, when those who directly contended with him, uh, people, remember even the original, uh, well, when the early parts of the Obama administration, even the former DNI before Clapper uh, came along in 2010, uh, was a f found to be, quote unquote, not in favor any longer. There's, a, there's ways in which it becomes, um, well, I say, you have, you have to sacrifice somebody, right? When, when you're talking about deep state, are you talking about the, the bureaucrats who have long-term jobs or who don't change because an administration change? Yes. Or are you talking that. about something more secret than that? No, I'm saying that it's combined with those who come in and out of office, but have these have significant positions of influence and power, whether whether it's the formal positions. But most of the people I'm talking about, you will never see, or with rare exception, on the front pages of any newspaper or media outlet. I mean, in the case of the CIA, I guess it's illegal to do that. Uh, well, they're depending on their position uh, or their previous positions. Uh, remember the principals group, some you made re reference to sort of the seconds and the other senior, uh, senior officials. 
Yeah, that's a very uh, powerful group in terms of sort of holding, holding sway. On the other hand, there's lots of rivalries. I would not want any of your listeners to think that the deep state is some kind of monolithic power that exerts uh, ex you know, unfettered, uh, unfettered ability to do anything it wants to. Uh, it certainly became easier uh, with a Cheney. And in, in terms of what you know about Pence, he says he wants Cheney to be his role model. Uh, I shudder. I shudder when I hear that. Hmm. All right, we're going to... Cheney, Cheney was one of the last... Who, the law in terms of constitution? No. I mean, that's not Cheney. Cheney, Cheney was about might. He really was, and about exercising that power. Remember, I may have said this to you in a previous uh, interview, Cheney always thought Nixon got a raw deal. If he ever got a chance, he would restore the imperial presidency. And that's Pence's model. Yes. Thanks very much for joining us again, Thomas. Uh, we'll pick up this discussion soon. Uh, sure, I look forward to that, and thanks for having me on your show. And thank you for joining us on The Real News Network.